Hello, I'm Andy Stevenson, and welcome to another episode of A Winning Mindset, Lessons from the Paralympics, brought to you by the International Paralympic Committee and their long-standing partner, Allianz. Together, our aim is for these podcasts to help you move forward in all aspects of your personal and professional lives. By hearing from Paralympic stars, you'll be introduced to stories that inspire and change the way you think. Stories of facing life's challenges with confidence, determination and excellence, and the true power of having the right team behind you. If this is your first time listening, then please do go back and discover earlier episodes with Tatiana McFadden and Andrew Parsons, amongst others. My guest today is somebody who had to learn very suddenly about acceptance. Daniel Chan of Hong Kong lost a leg in a car accident in 2008 and spent nearly a year in hospital. He talks to me about how he got through that period in his life and how he came to accept and embrace his new life in a wheelchair. Daniel will compete in wheelchair badminton at the Tokyo Paralympics. So hello Daniel, I believe you're joining us from Hong Kong now. So can you paint a picture for us of where you are? Yeah, now I'm at my home in Hong Kong just after training and hello everyone. And you're happy with me calling you Daniel because your real name, as it were, is is Chan Ho Yuan. Is that right? Is there a reason for picking Daniel as an alternative? Yes, yes. Daniel, I take this name when I was like 20 or 21 when I come out for working. So I think I should have a English name instead of Chan Ho Yun because Chan Ho Yun is a pronunciation from Chinese, no meaning. So it's not like the culture in Europe that everyone's name is given by their parents. Just like Daniel, I take it myself. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, Now, we're going to focus on a life-changing road accident that you were in 12 years ago. But first of all, I want to spend a bit of time talking to you about your life before that moment, because you were very sporty back then, weren't you? Yeah, I'm very sporty. I, I can't sit for like 15 minutes. For example, when I was in school, my performance in academics is not good. I can't only sit down and revise or to study. I, I need to walk, I need to move. And what kind of sports were you playing? Well, before my accident, I'm a half professional badminton player. I train myself like five days a week. Besides badminton, I still play football. I love football. I will play badminton and football quite often. Do you have a football team that you follow? Well, Manchester United for like uh, uh, 30 years. Oh dear, Daniel, we're going to have to stop the interview there, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> why, why? You have another team, your favourite team? I, I'm, a Liverpool, I'm a Liverpool supporter, I'm afraid, so oh. things are going quite well for me at the moment, not quite so well for you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I had to watch plenty of Man United trophies uh, <laughs> growing up, so I think it's uh, payback time. Yeah. We're going to talk predominantly uh, today about recovering from and dealing with and accepting uh, a disability that comes to you without without warning, a disability that came to you suddenly. Can you Mm. describe what happened on that day in 2008? You were 22 years old when life changed for you forever. Mm, Yes. Yes, Andy, you're right. It came really, really sudden. And uh, I still remember the day, you, you know, in Chinese, we have a Lunar New Year because Chinese New Year. And then the day when I, when, I get, when I got my accident is the Lunar New Year's Eve. That means the next day I should uh, come back from China to Hong Kong because I work in China uh, at that moment. So I come back from China to Hong Kong and celebrating the New Year's with my family. Unfortunately, I got my accident on the way back during my way back to Hong Kong. I'm the passenger of a vehicle and then uh, one of my manager is the driver. And then the last image, because I get a little bit drunk, so I stay at the back back seat of the car. So um, the last image is I get into the car and then I put on my seatbelt and then I slip. And then the next image is uh, I'm staying in the hospital. So you have pieces of memory that, okay, you wake up a little bit because you are too pain. And then someone seems like you're seeing the movie and then you, you, you sleep again. You spent 10 months in hospital. I think you had something like 15 major operations and eventually you had your left leg amputated right up near your hip, isn't it? Can, 
Can you put that experience into words when the doctors first said to you that amputation had to be done and, and when you woke up from that surgery, for example? Well, I still remember when I first woke up, I was still in the ICU, the intensive care unit. I, I see my doctor because everyone is in mass. So uh, I don't know why. I, I still remember I asked him in English because I think he is a foreigner doctor. So I asked if I have lost my, my legs. And the doctor told me that, yes, you have lost one leg. Then I, I make a joke to the, to the doctor, that, but I still alive, right? And then he said, yes. You, you, you can't imagine what happened that um, every three days you have a main surgery. Every three days you have a main surgery for keeping for three months. So it's really a tough time. And at that moment, no one is going to tell you how much you can go back like before. For example, how many percent you can walk like before. If you can run, you can jump. No one will tell you, even to the doctors, because they cannot commit. It's really, really quite hard to accept. Suddenly you become a um, disabled people. Uh, I still remember at that moment, I am quite ashamed to look at my, myself in the mirror. Because before you are a like uh, six feet tall, you know in Asia six feet tall is is really tall. So uh, mm-hmm. you're a tall guy with uh, not back looking, and then uh, you should have a good life uh, uh, in the future. And you're young, you were young, so uh, at that moment it's really really difficult to uh, admit that uh, you have that. Accident, and you keep asking yourself why you're so unlucky, why you get this accident, why you are that unfortunate. I mean, I, I'm I'm listening to this, just thinking, how on earth did you get through those days and weeks and months in hospital? Are there things that you can pinpoint that you? did or you were saying to yourself to just help pass that time I mean it's not just pass the time is it it's pass the time and also deal with this massive trauma that you've gone through and all your fears for the future mm. oh, I, I, I call that period is the dark age of my life and luckily in the hospital because I, I was young like 22 years old so the nurse even though the uh, male nurse or a female nurse they, they were quite pity of, of this boy. So uh, they come and talk with me so often, but they are not really talking very serious topic, but they just talk about the news. They talk about anything. They just uh, contrast my focus in my, in, my, in my pain and in my situation. And then my family, my friends, and my uh, girlfriend at that moment, today is my wife, uh, come to accompany me every day, visit me every day. So um, I can I can say uh, at that moment, I'm surrounding with love, so, so, so many love. So it's not really, really difficult at that 10 months. But the disaster things is when you come out and then you need to face the reality, the real world, and then that is the problems. Everything come, come so cruel at that moment. You mentioned the support of your family and the love of your girlfriend at the time, Sandy, who's now your wife. We have a a little surprise for you. Listen to this. Hello, thanks for giving me this chance to surprise my husband here. Daniel has a positive mindset. He always sees himself as a normal person, even if uh, he became disabled. And I think this is crucial to his success in badminton. I'm happy to see him staying at home much longer this year. He even prepared homemade dinner for me and looked after our dog at home, which I'm very much appreciated. To me, he is perfect. When you did that, is is live or you recorded it before? We recorded it before, yes. Sandy uh, sent us a little clip to, to use as a little surprise for you. Yeah, yeah, it shocked me. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Could you have got through that time in hospital uh, without Sandy and without your other family members? Uh, well, actually, I always have uh, down moments. I always have negative things. But lucky, uh, I, I need to appreciate my wife because uh, 
she is the rubbish bin in my life. I put all the negative things to her, and then she just flush it into the toilet. So, <laughs> you know, she she is the main listener in my life. I I will, I will tell her everything, good thing, bad things. Uh, especially now, I'm doing so many uh, community in the society. Then you will think something come from, for example. So, something come from the policy are uh, oh not good uh, something come from the association ridiculous something come from the people's reaction and not like what you are thinking so you have negative thinking every moment but uh, people look at me as just like an icon of positive and you have that role to show them positive so when you think like that okay you need to have your own way to solve all your negative things and then to give the energy to others. So I thank my wife. She really, she's really, really a good listener. You can hear her voice. It's really, really rational. So she can analyze everything to be good, not good. What thing you should do, what thing you should not do. Mm. And you mentioned this before we heard from Sandy, uh, and I just want to go back to it. Was there a difference between how you were feeling and coping with things in hospital compared to life when you came out into society? Well, um, every time, you know, I'm doing a lot of sharing in school and a lot of sharing to the young people. Every time they are asking my my hardest time after my accident, they all think the time in hospital is the hardest time, the toughest time in my life. But I say no, because in the hospital, it's really warm. Yes, it's true that I have so many main surgery. I uh, need to face the big changes because it comes so suddenly. But inside the hospital, especially in my in my ward, everyone got physically problem. Everyone got physically problem. So no one is going to discriminate you. So we are living like neighbors or like uh, a big big family. And then the nurse and the doctor is going to give you good care and then um, they really take care about your mental because they they know that you you're having a big changes but after you're going out to the real world everyone is normal so they are majority but you are minority people looking at me every day every moment when I come out it's not they are not going to discriminate you but you look strange so they put their eyes on you but you know when one people look at you, it's normal. But when everyone is looking on you, it makes you a little bit uncomfortable. So um, especially you need to continue your life because in hospital, you are just talking about to survive. But when you come out of the hospital, you need to continue your life. It's not only surviving. So you need to, for example, you need to make sure that you can move better than yesterday. You can move one more step than yesterday, training. And then uh, you need to find a job because you are 22 years old. So if you have 80 uh, for your life expectancy, so you are, you still have 58 years to go. So you need to think a way to make sure your life is good, especially when when you are old. So uh, it's really, really difficult at that moment. It's interesting to hear you describe the hospital as warm, in part because you had other disabled people around you. And then when you came out into the world, you were surrounded by people who didn't have disabilities. Had you had any experience of Mm. um, other people with disabilities in your life before your accident? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and. These, these people help me a lot. When I was in high school, and then one of my schoolmates is the uh, Borussia player. He was the gold medalist of Borussia BC4 Grey on um, 2004 in Greece. He was the gold medalist. But at that moment, in 2002 and 2003, he was my, my classmate. So he was my first disabled friend. So he, he was your friend... Before the accident, when b- before you were disabled, and then after your accident, he was one of the first people you contacted. So, what 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 kind of things were you saying to him after the accident? What kind of things were you asking him? Well, because uh, you know, every players in Borussia, they are uh, they have really really serious disability. 
So I'm just losing one leg. Compared with them, I'm really, I'm really lucky because I still have a chance to walk. When he come to the hospital to visit me, when I look at him, I started to understand and I tell him myself, he is much more difficult than me in the life. He does not need to say so much. Sitting in front of me, then his story is more than enough to to encourage me to 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 come back. You know, after my accident, my some of my friends, uh, no, all of my friends are coming to visit me because people are quite are quite worry I will uh, hurt myself or going to commit self suicide because I, I I was young, I am supposed to have a good life, but suddenly you have that serious accident and. Many of them are trying to say something like, no worries, no worries. I understand what you are suffering, so we are together. And you know, they are totally 100% physical good. So how can they understand what you are suffering, right? So uh, every time when I when I listen things like that, you will feel worse before you listen that. But Liao Yang Chi is the only one is powerful enough to sit in front of me and telling me, I understand what you are suffering. I understand what you are feeling. So believe me, you can come over the problems. You can pass through the, your problems today. You just need to enrich yourself every day and then day by day, improving a little bit, a little bit, and then you can rebuild your life. You believe him because he showed you. So uh, I can say he's one of my role models in my life. And have you played that role for anybody else? Have you been Lao Yen Chi to anybody else who's had an accident or lost a limb? Well, um, uh, I don't know whether I'm being others Lao Yen Chi, but I really do a lot of visiting for the, uh, for example, people have cancer, people have physical disability. So uh, when people need energy, I will go and try to be their Liao Yan Chi, of course. And how do you give them that energy? What, what are you doing and saying with those people? First of all, I will, I, will, I will tell them my story and how I come back to normal. And what I have faced, I will tell them some very funny story. I, I can share you one, of course. When I was sitting on wheelchair and I'm, uh, one day I'm going to practice, so I bring my racket, I bring everything, but I'm sitting on my wheelchair. So a, I think he was crazy. I think a crazy man come just in front of me and stand in front of me and saying, oh, you must doing some bad things in your last life. You know, in, in, in Chinese, we, we believe that you have your last life and then you have this life and then you, after you die, you have another life. And they, they say some bad things just on the street. So... Uh, well, at that moment, I was young. I don't know how to react. And maybe you can uh, show at him back and then you are very angry at that day and then you have a bad day. But I, what I done is I come across him and ignore him. I just think, okay, poor guy. You just lift the crazy man with a, with, with a smile and then he hasn't destroyed your day. So that would be good. I just want to read a quote to you. It's one of your own quotes I read in an article. You said, I was 22 years old. It should have been the best time of my life. Instead, I had become a man with a disability and there were times when I could not even look at myself in the mirror. I refused to accept that I was that person. That's an incredibly powerful thing to say. Just how difficult was it to, to look at yourself in the mirror and what kind of thoughts were going through your head at that time? I can I can describe these sentences in two different times. When I was 22, when I was facing my disability, I say that I really feel that because every time when I look at the, the television, they're showing the youngest, uh, the youth are all going out for party, for gathering, for pub, bar, and then they're going to, you know, have their fruitful life. And at that moment, I stay on my bed for over a year. I stay in my wheelchair for over two years. When I was 22, 23 or 24, I really think that oh, the accident really, really brought me a lot of uh, inconvenience and uh, destroying my life. But when I look back today, I, I think 
my accident is rebuilding myself, rebuilding my life, and then he create a better me like today. For example, before my accident, I am a people which really, really hot head, really, really bad temper, and I urge everything to come. But because you become a disabled a man with disability, so you can't urge everything. For example, when you're sitting on your wheelchair and then you want to arrive at places, but you have a stair in front of you, you can't urge anything. You can just find another way with slopes or with uh, uh, elevator or lift. That's what you can do. So at that moment, it made me have a better personality through the accident. So uh, today, when I look back, uh, I have a good career in sport and I also have a good path uh, for serving the community and doing so much thing in the society. And uh, people think I'm a good man all because mm. I got that accident. But that's that's really interesting, though, to hear you say. I think you were you were suggesting that you're a calmer person. You know, your personality has actually changed. You're a different character to what you were, or who you were before the accident. Is that is that right? And what other changes have you noticed? I I, I can tell you, Andy. Um, me and my wife, we review our life every three years to see uh, what the disability bring us, pros or cons advantage or disadvantage wow well and you write it down so you sit there with your wife and you say okay what are the good things and the bad things well because people always imagine what should i am doing today if i'm not getting my accident should i be a millionaire today or i I will be a bad guy i don't know because everyone think okay you have your your accident and you become a um, people with disability your life must going down but i deline I don't think so. I, I, I think I have a more fruitful life through my accidents. So for proving that, so I we, we will do a like a discussion time by time to see if we are having a better life or if we are a, uh, having a worse life. And then every year, the result come out is we have a better life. I really think that uh, the crush on that day is a correct move in my life. That's that's absolutely fascinating. I have heard this kind of thing before from people who have had disability thrust upon them by by an accident or by an illness. You know, I mean, I'm I'm disabled, but I'm disabled from birth, so I kind of feel like I am I'm just me. You know, there's been one of me, and I've been the same person throughout. Whereas you're saying that you you know the you are a different person out before the accident and actually you're a better person and you've had better life experiences that's that's quite an incredible thing to to think if exercise and sport weren't possible for you how much more difficult would it have been or would it be now to accept your disability if if you weren't able to to go out and get busy in the gym or, or whatever well, I haven't think like that, but I I, I, I did think that uh, I need a sport for my life. So I have a lifetime sport, whatever. It, it may not be badminton, it may be fencing, it may be basketball, but I need to find a way, a, a sport that accompany my life. Because before my accident or after my, after my accident, I always think that the people need to have a sport not only to uh, uh, sharing your time, not only to spending your time, but the people need to support to to perfect their life mentally or physically. So uh, I need a sport. But at the same moment, some way you're right, Andy, sport perfect my life because sport will build my confidence after my accident. And with that in mind, how significant was it for you to get back into badminton, especially a sport you had played before your accident? How important was it for you to get back Mm. to that sport? And also, how different did you find wheelchair badminton when you started to play? It is really um, funny that people are thinking when I first playing wheelchair badminton are really limited. They are thinking because you are jumping, you are running before, but now you're sitting on the wheelchair. But for me, because before I sit on my sport wheelchair the first time, I'm sitting on an electric uh, wheelchair so you have a very limited life 
So when I first time to have my uh, wheelchair badminton practice, like 11 years ago, I really think I have my wing to fly on the sky because you have no limit. You can move at where you want. It's not electric. It's, it's by manual. You move it yourself, especially you are doing a sport, a familiar sport in a familiar area, just like what you were doing before. So I, I love my, my first, I still remember my first training. I really, really, I just used one second, then I fell in love with wheelchair badminton. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people listening who, you know, have no connection to the Paralympics, potentially no connection, maybe even to disability, but they are people who have had some sort of huge change in their life, you know, a massive upheaval, uh, you know, a breakup of a relationship, losing a job, uh, bereavement of some kind. And I hope they're listening to this and thinking, well, actually, um, using what you've just said there, Daniel, looking at things in a positive way and thinking, actually, I can use these huge events, which were traumatic and devastating, but I can use them in a way to make my life better. I mean, that's that's such a powerful message for you to be giving. Yes. As um, in my sharing of the young people, I always have a quote that it's very, very important for a, for a single vocabulary called choice. You have no choice to decide what happened to you or how people to look at you, but you have the choice how, what, what is your attitude to facing those problems or to facing those people who look at you. So it's all your choice. If you look back, then the things goes back. If you look good, the things goes well. So it's all your choices, not others. We're obviously looking ahead to Tokyo next year. The Paralympics postponed until 2021. Uh, how excited were you when badminton, para badminton, was added to the Paralympics for Tokyo? For a para athlete, a Paralympic is a holy place that um, the highest, the highest platform and the net the world know how good you are. And uh, I think 10 years ago, I tried to tell some of my friends and some of my relatives, some member of my family that uh, I would like to be the first people in Hong Kong who play in wheelchair badminton and go into Paralympics. And then over 50% of them are saying be crazy. And, chasing and pursuing a dream that is impossible. But now, today, I achieve it. I am going to achieve it. So I'm proving if you have your dream, you chase it in the right way, somehow, someday, you will achieve it. Well, I have to say, yeah, I don't want you to be modest because uh, I think you show incredible character to, to come back from from what happened to you in 2008. And... Some of the things you've said, you know, will really stick with me and I'm sure they'll stick with people listening uh, about being able to look at your life and thinking, actually, that accident and my disability has improved my life in, in lots of ways. That's an incredible acceptance. It's more than an acceptance, isn't it? It's an acceptance, but a celebration almost of, of what happened to you as, as, as uh, disastrous and traumatic as it was. Thank you so much. Daniel Chan there, I found his positivity to be really uplifting and his reflections on having your life taken away and replaced by a completely different one were fascinating. If you enjoyed listening to Daniel and me, then please do subscribe to this podcast. And if the mood takes you, then do give us a rating and a review as well. I'm excited about next week's episode. I was born in Northern Ireland and my mum's family were all from the Republic of Ireland. So I'm looking forward to talking to Irish Paralympic swimmer Ellen Keane. Ellen was born with part of her left arm missing and is something of a national hero. We'll be talking about the joys and responsibilities of being a role model. Speak then. Speak then.